We're ready. All right, Father in heaven, have mercy on us this morning. Uh, we know you're ready. Help us to get ready. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Part three. As you may recall, the other day, we, uh, I showed that picture. I called it like the river of healing, river of life, right? Based on Ezekiel 47, 2, that says 33. It should be 3 and 4, and then I added 5 on the end of there. Behold, there ran out waters on the right side. He brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. Again, he measured a thousand, brought me through the waters. The waters were to the uh, knees. He measured a thousand, brought me uh, through. The waters were to the loins. And then how deep did it finally get? So deep you could not pass over. over why does it need to be so deep that you can't pass over? Now, why does it need to cover the earth? 2414 of Matthew, the gospel shall be preached as a witness to where? Um, why all the world? Because God desires that everyone should be saved. Simple. All the fish have to hear, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if you miss, uh, you miss like a little part of Barbados, maybe somebody's on that island that would hear and do. Mm -hmm. True? True. Okay. Some would say, I don't know. There are some that don't know that don't care. Mm -hmm. You'll never know unless the ones that don't know hear, and then you'll know if they care. Mm -hmm. Because if they hear and they care, they what? Sooner or later, right? Sooner or later, yeah. So I do not know. Who'd like to read the next one? I don't care. <laughs> now, the only way to reach those that know, I'm sorry, those that don't know but care, is to tell how many. Oh. And that includes those that don't care. So there's my, that's my uh, long introduction to that Bible verse. Here Ecclesiastes 11.6. I want it was one in six. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Pause. What's that mean? Throw that bread out there. Spread the word. Yeah. Because you never know. Right. You never know who's going to take it. The some of the people that look least likely to be saved will be in the kingdom. And some that I was sure would be there will never see the pearly gates. Now, Rick, verse 6. In the morning sow thy seed. And in the evening withhold not thine hand. For thou knowest not whether shall prosper either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. And in the context of those verses, you look at the weather, you don't sow. It doesn't look like we're going to, you know, just, yeah, no, you sow it. You throw it. You cast it. And that's, uh, that's your business this morning, brother. It's your business, I'm sorry, it's God's business that the fish eat that bread, not yours, right? I cast the bread. Okay, so far so simple. Our job, cast a bread. When we cast a bread, all the fish that want to bite, will bite. Those that don't, won't. But how many get a chance? All. When I married Darlene, I know, sorry, going, going back to the past for 30 seconds. When I married Darlene almost 40 years ago, I fast talked her, took her down to the justice of the peace, going to marry her before she could change her mind. Got her off that motorcycle. Says, stop reading my poem. Get off that new age spiritualism stuff for just one hour and say I do. Took her down the justice of the peace. All her friends said the same thing. Don't marry him. It's the biggest mistake you'll ever make in your life. It's the biggest mistake you'll ever make. Right? Friends, I didn't know. But when I found out, I cared. I did. I'm not caring enough. I need to care more. I'm not, I'm not there. I'm a mess. But I heard that kind of thing. I heard, wow. Wow. This is... You hear the Bible, and wow, wow, that's different. That's so different. 18, one of the great pioneers of the, of the church, John Norton Loughborough. That S-O-O-H-M, story of our health message, it's on our website. You can download the thing for free. I got so aggravated that that book had gone out of print, and it is so good that we got it, scanned it, indexed it. It's a PDF file and gave it to everybody on planet Earth. It's there. You can search it. And, and, that, and, that, and that book is not just a book. Mrs. White, when she died, she commanded somebody write this book. And uh, what was his name? Uh, Robinson, D.A. Robinson, started writing it. They got sent off to China. And then, uh, I'm sorry, C.C. Chrysler started writing it, got sent off to China, D.A. Robbins came and finished it. Who would happened to marry her granddaughter, Mrs. White's granddaughter? At the age of 18, when young Jay and Loughborough was just, this is coming out of that book, when Jay and Loughborough was just beginning to preach, he was advised to use what? Got a little problem here. <laughs> some tobacco. Here. 
as a remedy for a lung difficulty, which followed a slight hemorrhage. Best thing for hemorrhage, right? Start snorting tobacco. He accepted this advice as good counsel and formed the habit of smoking cigars. You know how many of them seven abdomens were smokers in the beginning? Pig eaters and smokers, a whole lot of them. They did not? No. no, thank you. About two years later, there passed before his mind the contrast between the fitness, the filthiness of the tobacco habit, the clean lives and purity of those who would dwell in the New Jerusalem. This is what this is one of those divine revelations. A deep and vivid impression that there would enter into that city nothing that should defile him then and there. Somebody read it. I can't see, quite see it. Somebody read it. Defile led him then and there to throw a partly smoked cigar into the river and to abandon forever the use of tobacco. In later years, as the health reform movement made progress among Seventh-day Adventists, a number of the ministers bore testimony to the benefits they had received through adopting its principles. In so doing, they naturally looked back to the hole of the pit once they had been digged, and they could clearly see that there... Now, pause. How many have been pulled out of the pit? And if you raise your hand and say, I wasn't in the pit, I'll say, you bold-faced liar, you. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, everybody, everybody's been pulled out of the pit. You want the verses on that? Come on. Ye who were dead and trespassed and sin, Ephesians 2, 1. The Bible is a book saying you're in the pit. And if the Lord doesn't throw down the safety line, who's coming out? Nobody. A man cannot save himself. Now, I want to read this last little part of the sentence. They could clearly see that their former weakness and suffering were due to their, say it, lack of knowledge they did not know. All right? No, Lothborough didn't know. But when he knew, he did. That's building on the, that's our study this morning. This is Mrs. White's will. Part of her, she died in 1915. This is Mrs. White's will. She said, I'm dead now. This is what you need to do. E.G. White's will dated February 12, 1912, but she died in 1915. A provision was made regarding certain proposed books. This is from the preface in the book, Story of a Health Message. Uh, which she greatly desired to be prepared. Among these was an historical work listed as experience of E.G. White in connection with the health reform movement among Seventh-day Adventists. I guess the title was too long, right? So they ended up calling it the what? Story, Story of a Health Message by uh, the man that married her granddaughter, D.E. Robinson, Doris C. Robinson. This is the first page, first chapter in that book. And by the way, if you've never read the book, it's not what you think. It's a lot of uh, sources, secular sources, giving the lie of the land as God brought health message to, to the church and into the world. It's excellent. George Washington, who was he? First president. First president. Now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna show you the paragraph and it starts naming some things in this paragraph that most of you don't know what they are. Calomel and Timony and all these things, mercuric salts, you don't know what it is. So then I'm going to modern day sources to describe what it is. Mm -hmm. You'll see, it's not confusing. George Washington. Uh, the Times, Chapter 1, The Times of This Ignorance. Just at the turn of the 19th century, George Washington, now ignorant means you don't know. No. Okay. 19th century, George Washington was, a, was stricken with a sickness that in a few days was to prove fatal. That's how George died. Mm -hmm. As soon as he realized that he was seriously ill, he sent... Not for a well, who did he send for? A because that is the president. This is cutting edge medicine. Mm -hmm. Got to have a man come in with some knives and some leeches and cut me open and bleed me to make me well. God's looking down through the stream of time and seeing that kind of mess and seeing his church exposed to that kind of butchery. And he says, I got to send him a what? Health message. Mm -hmm. Yeah. God didn't send me a bleeder. He sent me Mrs. White. But for a bleeder who took from his veins 14 ounces of blood, the next morning the family physician was called. Now, when the family physician got there, he was alarmed. So what did he do? Called two other physicians. What did they do? Bled him some more. <laughs> 
The next morning, the family physician was called, who, discovering the case to be highly alarming, called two of the doctors for consultation. The minds came together, best medical care on planet Earth, President of the United States. While waiting for them, he directed a second copious means, big by the way, second copious bleeding. Now back, they termed it heroic medicine. This is the definition of what it was. Heroic medicine, also referred to as heroic depletion theory, a therapeutic method advocating rigorous treatment by bloodletting, purging, and sweating to shock the body back to health. <laughs> after an illness caused by immoral balance, imbalance. It might shock you for me to cut you open, but I don't know if it's going to heal you, right? Mm -hmm. Now this was uh, one of the uh, champions of uh, uh, bleed them till they die. His name was Dr. John Letson. He's also a poet. In England in the 18th century, Dr. John Letson, Letson was one of the foremost physicians of the day. He was born in the British Virgin Islands to a Quaker family and trained in the medicine at Edinburgh University in Scotland. He became a distinguished physician and abolitionist. Among his achievements, he was the founder of the London Medical Society, which is the oldest medical society in the UK. He was a great advocate of heroic medicine and even wrote humorously about himself, his own practices. Now, Sister Aisha, you want to read the poem? I'm John Letson, blisters, bleeds, and sweat <laughs> If after that they please to die, I, John, let some. I, John, let some. Blisters, bleeds, and sweats them. And after that they please to die, I, John, let some. Yeah, let me take out a quarter too. Yeah. Using what? A nice, uh, you know, ice pick. You want to be more sophisticated, use what? What's in the jar? Leeches. Oh, yeah. If you're bold, you use blades. Yeah. And this is what they subjected our first president to because this was the cutting edge, top notch mm -hmm. medicine in the United States, also known as allopathic medicine, the way medicine is practiced at any given time in history. This is the way where everybody did. Now go down to the next morning, the family physician was called. Now the last part, he directed a second copious bleeding. Upon the arrival of his first of his cons consultants in the afternoon, it was agreed to try the result of another bleeding. When about 32 ounces of blood were drawn. You know how much blood you've got in your body? It's like you're a quart low in the car, now you're two quarts, you took out two more quarts? Come on, the engine's not going to run. Without the slightest alleviation of the disease. Now, this is why I quote this. Kennebec intelligence here. He's taking secular sources to give the lie of the land as God brought health, health reform. The world was ready for it. The world was ripe for hydrotherapy, vegetarian diet, natural remedies. The debil this debilitating treatment was followed by, now what is all that stuff? Blisters, calomel, tartar emetic, what is that anyway? This is what it is. Blistering involved, you take some really ice, nice hot, I uh, hot, icy, hot, steaming hot things, you put it on, uh, you put it on Devin. What's that gonna do to him? Blister. It's hot as fire. The blister comes up, get my Swiss blade. <laughs> now I'm gonna cut you open. I'm gonna bleed you a little bit, bring you back to life. That's blisters. Blisters involved placing hot plasters on the skin to raise blisters which were then, then drained. The most common purgative was calomel. What was it? Mercury. <laughs> Anybody want some mercury? Mercuric chloride, which what we worked as a laxative. I don't doubt it would. <laughs> Wouldn't that clean you out? Yes. In small doses, but usually was prescribed in larger doses to purge the system. So let's, uh, let's cook him and then give him some mercury. Yeah. No, he'll bring tartar medic in. <laughs> he's, he's still sick, Rick. What are we going to do? Tartar medic. Poisonous, colorless, transparent, rhombic crystals or white powder with a metallic sweetish taste. It's a sweet taste of death. Chemically, it is potassium antimony tetrate, tartrate. Medically, it was formerly used as an emetic and expectorant to produce sweating and in treatment of several diseases, but had frequent toxic side effects. You win some, you lose some. If I bleed to death, I let some. <laughs> it's almost like reading a, a comedy, a black comedy. Can this be true? As Mrs. White, she buried her first son. Upon the arrival of the first of these consultants and drop down, this is where we stop. The debilitating treatment was supplemented by the application of blisters, administration of calomel, repeated doses of tartar medic, vapors of vinegar, tobacco, some opium, some cocaine, some liquor, and they'll straighten you right up. And God's sitting on the throne. It is not surprising to learn from a contemporary report that Washington's last request a lot of what he has, contemporary reports, 
This is not a Bible study. This is the world at the time when God gave the message. He goes right through to Loma Linda. A uh, report that Washington's last request, come on, what would his last request be? Oh, please, just leave, me alone. leave me die. Leave me die. <laughs> no more treatment. Details of the progress of the illness and particularly of the methods employed for the relief of the famous patient were made public. Why? They, they trumpeted it all across the nation to show that he got what? Treatment. What kind of treatment? The best. The best. Not in any wise as a reflection upon the skilled attending physician, but on the contrary, to give assurance that the beloved leader had received the best of care mm -hmm. and that his untimely death occurred in spite of all that human knowledge and skill could devise to arrest the course of the disease. And you say medicine's come a long way since then? Mm -hmm. I was given some medicine possible side effect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Pastor Atwood was given a medicine for his heart condition. His wife, Jeanette, read it. Possible side effect, first one, death. <laughs> the beginning of our health message. Now we're going to go back and we're going to go from back then until now and go off from some tangents along the way. Where did it start? So I want to look at the beginning of it. The church became the church. The General Conference of Seventh-day Adventist Church. A General, a General Conference of Seventh-day Adventist became a incorporated body in 1863 not 44 but 20 years later almost mm -hmm. they had a little they had a little conference here in Michigan they had little state things and they had churches here but what tied it all together 1863 it was interview and herald article of May 26 a group of 21 delegates representing 3570 Adventists met in Battle Creek Michigan for the purpose of securing unity and efficiency in labor in promoting the general interests of the cause of present truth and in perfecting the organization of seven-day Adventists. And they did. The result was the formation of the General Conference and a linking together of local churches, uh, state conferences, etc. Et the fully united, fully organized seven-day Adventist church was born. Now, if you're not acquainted with the past and the health message, and, the, and, the, and that's fine. But the big message that came, we call it, that was the big health message, came in 1860. Before then, Adventists were big pork eaters. 63, June 6, no more pork. June 6, 1863, how, much, how long was it until the church was organized? How long before the message came? Maybe a month or less than a month. Less than a month. Did God know what he was doing? Mm -hmm. First things first, get the church together and then get them well. Mm -hmm. This has been God's plan from day one. And there it is. Third Selected Messages is where you find it. Uh, it was at the house of Brother A. Hilliard at Otsego, Michigan. Now, the reason I'm covering this, I'd like to add, start adding Bible verses in there. Uh, Matthew 9, 22. And uh, that night, they were holding mission uh, meetings in Otsego. James White and her husband went up. Now, you may know the story. If you don't, that's fine. They got down to pray. James White had been sick repeatedly. The answer for James White's sickness was to pray. He was sick. She got up, put her hands on her husband's shoulder. You can read about it, third select the messages, put her hands on her husband's shoulder, and did as she'd done many times in the past. Oh Lord, have mercy and heal James. And that night she got a better answer than she'd gotten before. God gave her a message to get James well and to keep him well. The problem is he kept getting well, answered a prayer, right? Kept getting well, then kept what? Going right back to it. He called us out of a pit to give us something better. And that night, no more pork, and the message unfolded. It was a huge message. It covered every aspect, diet, dress. I mean, everything was covered. And she wrote on that thing for a long time. So uh, that the great subject of health reform was open before me in vision. Now you say lifestyle medicine is very common today. Garth Davis, Michael Greger, Alan Clapper, Dean Ornish, Carl Esselstyn, T. Colin Campbell. <laughs> Yeah, but nobody's got what the Adventists have. Matthew 9, 22, thy, it's a woman with an issue of blood 12 years, thy has made thee whole. We work faith in with the message, right? It's, no, it's more than obedience. It's the just shall live by faith. Romans 3, 4, it's righteousness by faith. Here it comes, Rick. First, second, and third angel's message. That's the health message. Righteousness by faith. That's it. You cannot separate the two. You get rid of the health message, you just flush righteousness by faith right down the toilet. 
It's walking by 2 Corinthians 5, 7, faith and not by sight. Naaman said, that's not for me, hydrotherapy. And then what did Elisha say? Then healing ain't for you. <laughs> the man that gets it will get the health message and the gospel. You can't separate the two. You can't. What is lifestyle medicine? Not what, the, not what the world says. Change your diet, change your this, change your that. No, change your heart. That's lifestyle medicine. And only we have it. Allopath, osteopath, homeopath, naturopath. Now, the path that leads to Christ. I call it, the, again, Luke 24, Road to Emmaus. Isn't that good? Amos 3, 3, two walking together. Where did the kingdom of health or the kingdom of holiness or the kingdom of eternal life? Same place, John 10, 10. The thief comes but what? Give you the knockout punch to your health. Christ comes to do what? And not Devin at 95 years old going to live 100 more years. That's Devin like a flower springing into bloom for eternal ages. Ah, oh, this is a good message. Oh, it's a good message. Prostate cancer, get behind me. <laughs> you know, December 25, 1965. Now, I don't know if God has a sense of humor or what. But this came on Christmas. Christmas present. He gave a Christmas present. I know Jesus wasn't born on December 25. But nevertheless, God gave a Christmas present. Who read? What was the present? <clears throat> Tell my people that they must establish an institution of their own. A home where the sick can be treated and where they can learn how to get well and keep, keep well. well. There it is. See, I stole that from her. How to get well and keep well. Now, does the health message cut like a two-edged sword? Yes. Is it designed to cut things like, uh, now i got to be careful what I say. Mm -hmm. uh, careful what I say. Don't want to say ramen noodles. I don't want to say Cheetos. <laughs> got to be careful what I say. Don't want to say ice cream. Uh, don't want to say, ah, what, do I, what am I going to say? Can't think of anything. Is it designed to cut Hershey Kisses right out of your life? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. yeah. Now, I'll read this one. Review and Herald, uh, April 30, 2014. Now, I mean 1914. <laughs> The Western Health Reform Institute, later called Battle Creek Sanitarium, opened the following year in 1866. What came out? The big magazine, focusing on what? Health reform. There it is. Western Health Reform Institute. Oh, yeah, sure I can. Did this place, did the Western Health Reform Institute, was it small? Yes. Did it fill up? Yes. <laughs> it's like a lifeboat on the ocean. You got a hundred something zillion sick folks, and there's the lifeboat. Come and get well. I am the Lord, that last verse in Exodus 15, that healeth thee. I'll put none of these diseases upon you. This is what they were preaching back then. I thought they were preaching the three angels' message. They didn't separate the two. Well, it was not designed for the two to be separated. Now, is that a hey, Western Health Reform Institute? And then it grew into what? Until 1902. Now, does anybody remember the greatest danger I face as a manager in a health institution is losing? And there were two things listed. The second one, losing my, starts with an S. <coughs> remember the first one? I should have put it in here. Losing the spirit of present truth. Catalog kept the simplicity but lost the present truth. 1902, God burned the place down. Did he mean business when it came to the health message? Oh, yes. God said, I play no game when it comes to this. You might want to, you might want to try to you know, assassinate the, uh, the doctrine of the, of, the, of the Godhead. You might want to twist up sanctification. You touch the health message, you're in trouble. Mm, -hmm. mm not the health message. God has set a guard around that. When Adam ate that apple, he said, get me an angel with a flaming sword. Mm, he messed with the health message. <laughs> mm, the angel was going to take his head off. Don't mess with the health message. Okay. What, 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 uh, nothing's going to happen. Mm. The fireman said it's like we pour gas on the thing as we pump the water in. We saw an angel with a flaming sword standing over there. Get the sword. Get the the probably the same guy. <laughs> same guy's going to come in here and take off some heads if we're not careful. All right. Now, as I show you about a dozen pictures, just tell like we're dressed like that, that old old timey dress. It looks just like what we're doing here. Should it? Yes. Can you tell now you see the little I, all these old pictures? Can you can you read the little captions up there? What's that say? The top of the yeah. And, and they were doing some sun treatments there. And this is what they were doing. Now this is of course what Kellogg rebuilt, the bigger one, the bigger one. 
So when it burned down, he rebuilt this. Lost the spirit of present truth, right? But he didn't lose the health message. I'm sorry, he didn't lose the simplicity. He had health, but like Dean Ornish, he didn't have the gospel. Now, can you read the little teeny captions? Dining room, right. and what do you think they were serving there? Cornflakes. Yeah, you asked the head surgeon here, the guy on the far left, Lay, Dr. Lay. Now, what are they doing? Come on, friends, what are they doing? Aerobic exercise. Now, Isha's doing the same thing. It may be two or three. They had 150, but you're still, we're doing the same thing. Smaller scale. Mm -hmm. But the thing about a smaller scale, you know, the, Dr. Lay, the superintendent at that time, this is before catalog, superintendent in the beginning, how many of those people do you think he personally got to know? Dr. Lay, they came for two weeks, 150 people. 150 people. How well do we get to know folks? Very well. Very well. Because I tell you what, Dr. Lay was not sitting at the table with him. Or if he was sitting at the table with him, he might talk to two or three, but not 150. Yeah, you get to know people here, don't you? And because you get to know people, you get to see faults that nobody else sees us. And because you get to see faults nobody else sees us, you have opportunity to be a criticizer and a backbiter. And Revelation 12, verse 10, they accused the brethren when day and night. Yeah, we got, we got, a, we got a cat burst seat. We have an, an, a perspective not many people have. This is the danger of a small place. Everybody knows. Everybody Thank you. About yeah. You do. That's just how it is. Now, chow line, right? Do you think they're serving cheese omelets? No. <laughs> no. Now, what, what is this here? A little, uh, little flexibility, some stretching, some physical therapy. This is not the Inquisition. <laughs> this is Battle Creek Sanitarium. <laughs> a little compaction of the spine, right? Now, Catalog masterminded all this thing. That guy was a genius. He really was. How about that? Can you tell what that is? Uh, hot baths. Yeah, it's one of those hydrotherapy. Hot baths. So it was hydrotherapy. And this is the new one that he bought. How big that place was. You want to see the backside of it? That place was huge. Today, it's owned by the U.S. government. It's a, it's a, court, it's a courthouse, I think, now. The government liked it. God didn't. Why? They lost the present truth. It's not enough to have three angels' message in health. you got to have, got to have it all. Anyway, let's go out and get some limbered up this morning. <laughs> Outdoor exercise? Oh, no, well, come on, this is Michigan. I know, Rick lived in Michigan, right? It's, you, you can't have outdoor exercise in January. Well, you could. <laughs> Who's leading the thing? Are you going to close up? Now, roll your shoulders. <laughs> Isn't that great? They say John Harvey Kellogg was riding his bicycle at 92. Guess what he was? But he was riding straight toward the lake of fire. He lost his, yeah, he lost it. But he had the message. Mm -hmm. Toasted cornflakes. Mm-mm, good. You want to see the factory they're made in? <laughs> of course. And you get to the 40s and 50s, they look like that. As far as I know, this is the first statement. If you find one earlier, you let me know. As far as I know, this is the first statement Mrs. White ever made regarding diet. First one. Deny the unhealthy appetite. I read it to ask a question. Eat less fine food. Eat coarse food. What's that mean, less fine food? Eat coarse food? What's that mean? Less refined. Well, in, co in coarse means, yeah, what you're saying. We, so we, today we'd say bread. What we, we call it what today? Whole yeah, they know whole grain, whole wheat. They didn't have those words. Uh, then as you sit at the table, you can, from the heart, ask God's blessing upon the food. Can you sit at the table and ask God to bless what you're about to eat? Mm -hmm. Can you sit at the table and ask God to bless what you're about to drink? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Somebody said, well, God will sanctify anything. I'll serve you a plate of cockroaches to see what you say. Come on. And that's what, they twist, take that verse and they twist it up. <laughs> and uh, We're going to spend an hour on that on Wednesday. That's my plan at the moment. One T, this is another statement, the early statements. But notice in this one, the words change just a little bit. It's a religious duty for every Christian girl. You mean that's a duty for God? Yeah, if you don't know how to make bread, men too, right, Rick? Come on, Alan, right? Yeah, come on, Devin, right? It is a religious duty for every Christian girl and woman to learn at once to make good, sweet, light bread from. There it is. What? And today we'd say that's high in fiber. 
Okay, you're a step ahead of me, Devin. Stepper, high of fiber. <sighs> Kellogg had the food, but it didn't say fiber on it. Why? Didn't know what it was. <laughs> fiber, what's that? You know, he didn't know. But he knew this. Take the food the way God made it. We take the grapes God made and ferment it. We take the poppy that's beautiful to look at and refine it. We take them go right on down the list. Demerol, right? It's an opiate. Everything we take that's killing us, we took something natural and made it into something natural. Including a Big Mac. <laughs> yeah. Now, we got the label today. All right. We got the label right today. Boom, we say fiber. On the bottom left, who'll read? Come the complete Phoenix diet. High fiber cooking. High fiber cooking. Now read the big thing. Oatmeal what? Come on, Quaker. It's always had always had fiber in it. We've discovered something here. <laughs> fiber. Oh, he ain't fiber. I think I showed this in the church. This lady get a mammogram. By the way, those science of diagnostic testing for, for uh, breast tumors and everything, that's all changed. Right? I hope all you ladies are informed on that. Same with prostate cancer for men. Mm -hmm. The ball game has changed about this getting regular diagnostic things. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we do know the link between low fiber diet and high incidence of breast cancer. If you, I speak to ladies first, if you want breast cancer, eat white pasta. The reason we don't serve you white pasta is we don't want you to get breast cancer. Is that okay? If you want breast cancer, brothers, eat what? White pasta. You want breast cancer? I'm sorry. Well, breast cancer is coming, breast cancer is becoming more common for men, a prostate. You want prostate cancer? Eat ramen noodles, period. <laughs> Why are you preaching so hard against ramen noodles? Because I love you. So I love you. White bread. White bread will take you to a place you do not want to go. Where? Cancer ward. Don't talk like that. I didn't. God did. We're getting the health message this morning. Uh, science, anyway, so we read just one study. Just a little teeny part of it. 35,000 women in Leeds, England. 35,000. How they got that many people together, I will never know. Involving 35,000, the most comprehensive, one of the most scientific, the largest skills to everything. They nailed it down. Massive study in England involving 35,000 women conducted over the course of seven years? Seems to indicate premenopausal women before menopause who eat 30 grams of fiber a day cut their risk of breast cancer compared to those who eat less, 20 grams a day. If you want less breast cancer, eat more fiber. That's it. Well, how much fiber should I eat? Even the foods God made, God gave you just the right amount. Mm -hmm. Researchers at the Leeds University Center for Epidemiology and Biostatistics who publish the results in the latest issue of the International Journal of Epidemi Epidemiology say... Women who had a greater percentage of calories derived from protein and lower intakes of dietary fiber and vitamin C, if you're on a high plant-based diet, your diet is jam-packed with, is it fiber? Yes. Nutrients? Yes. Phytochemicals? Yes. Antioxidants? Yes. 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 High meat diet? Cholesterol? Yes. Nutrients? No. <laughs> Saturated fat? Yes. Yes. Yeah, you just, no-brainer, choose ye this day. Joshua 24, 15. It's just one's life, one's death. Oh, Israel, why will you destroy yourself? Choose ye this day. Life versus death. Ah, the health message. Now, Proverbs 26, 2. The curse does not come without a what? Cause. It always has a cause. Uh, be, explain that a little more simply. Uh, Brother Devin, you want to read that for me? Cause. I cause is why something happens. Okay. Well, now I got breast cancer. Going to use natural remedies. My dear sister, you waited a little too long. It's good to go make the assault with God's natural remedies, but prevention is better. Somebody finish the sentence for me. Cure. Avoiding prostate cancer is job one, right? Now, number one cause of death for people in America and in the world, number one cause of death is what? Heart disease, heart and blood vessel disease. Now here's a shocking statistic coming out of Babylon. 80% of heart disease is preventable. Come on, you gotta be kidding me. Ask Dean Norris, you put him on the cover of Newsweek. What did he say back in 1990? Nobody has to get it. If you have it, you don't have to keep it. It can be reversed. That's what said, a toothless paper tiger. That was 1990. Today, to almost 30 years later, number one cause of what? is nothing's changed. We got smart, but we still got dead because knowledge is not enough. The devil more than you, knows more than you know. Knowledge is not enough. It's not enough. 
But one thing we can start doing is a man thinketh in his heart. 23, 7 of Proverbs. So he is. We can start thinking. Let this mind be in you, Philippians 2, 5, right? If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, what? Philippians 4, 8. Mm -hmm. Think on these things. Come on, be transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind, eh? Romans 12, verse 2. we got to start thinking. Now I'm going to challenge you to think. Now, may I have your permission to be straightforward in the last 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. yes. You sure? Mm -hmm. Okay, nobody's objecting. Um, we go to the... We go to the uh, <laughs> Uh, we go to the shopping mall. Blood pressure, 240 over 170. The person taking your blood pressure does this. Ah! Go where? They tell you, go where? Come on, you come to Waynesboro and I'm doing the blood pressure check. It's 240 over 100, 240 over 220. I'm going to go, ah! Go where? Go CK at the emergency room. And you ought to go when? Uh, okay, now, because medications will bring your numbers down. That'll keep you from getting a stroke or a heart attack. It won't fix the problem because you didn't address the what? Proverbs 26 2? The cause. They'll give you a what? Calcium blocker diuretic. They'll give you a pill. Now, what's the cause of hypertension? Ramen noodles. <laughs> Processed food. Ramen noodles. And so. This is going to warm me up. I'm going to take this off. I'm a seven-day Adventist, and I got hypertension, and I'm going to start cursing God. No, you can't. And the Lord looks down here at us, and He marvels at our un... John 4, Mark, Mark 4, 30, 40 and 41. He marveled at your unbelief. We don't believe Him. You say, well, I'm 24 years old. I stay up all night. I eat what I want to. I don't drink any water. I smoke. I drink. I do whatever I want to do. And I'm, I'm feeling fine at 24. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. But dear friends, at 44, dead as a doornail. And then your wife or your husband curses God because they took my spouse early. Mm -hmm. And God sits up there. Oh, yeah, yeah. I would not want to be God for one second. And then the, the devil knows this. The devil knows this. He knows the place. I wish I brought the verse. The place where God communicates to us is, guess what part of our bodies? Frontal the frontal lobe. This is a picture of a frontal lobe. Axons and dendrites, nerve cells, right, and everything. We do a lot of this in the, in, the, in the health lectures. You have that long fiber that communicates with the short fiber. Axon, dendrite, short one, synapse. You got the physiology, right? You got the synapse in between. The neurotransmitter crosses it. But that axon is, is insulated, and uh, uh, transmission is expedited, insulated by the myelin sheet, the purple thing on the axon. If you have hypertension, the axon begins to disintegrate. You take a pill, numbers come down. What happens to the axon? Because you cannot, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot transgress the break. You cannot transgress God's health laws and cover it with a pill. No, no. you can't. Because it does not address the cause. The pill doesn't address the cause. President Obama, President Obama stole my health lecture, did not send me down one penny for it. All improvement requires what? Yes. And if Washington's ever going to get better, something has to yes. vote him out and vote me. Yes. <laughs> and they elected him because you could not dispute the truth of what he said. You can't. All improvement requires change. Do we like to change? No way. There's a way that seemeth right to a man. Proverbs 14, 12. But then thereof is a way of what? Isaiah 55, 8. My ways are not your ways. Somebody's got to change direction. Jesus can't give life. The devil can't give death. John 10, 10. And then Jesus says, Malachi 3, 6. I am the Lord. I change. 13, 6 of Hebrews. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. Choose you this day. I'm walking toward life and you're walking straight toward death. Change direction. And we say... I can't. Now we're getting to the heart of the health message. Something's missing. The heart of the health message. The heart of new start is a new heart. heart. A new start? Well, let me change that. A new start without a new heart is an impossibility. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Lifestyle change? 
Forget it. It'll never happen. Without the three angels' message, that's it. Now, this, everybody's seen it, right? Yeah. Or you should have if you haven't. We show it to all our guests. Esselstyn, T. Colin Campbell. My dear friends, there is a mountain of uh, information in that, but not one grain of motivation. It is jam-packed full of principles, not one jot of power. It is all about new start, but not one word about what? New heart. It's completely secular. Is it good? Yeah. We show it to our guests? Yeah. Will it get you to heaven? No way. You can't eat grains and go to heaven. You might stay out of the cancer ward. The lake of fire is a different story. You have to have both. If you talk about health and leave out the gospel, God is like a broken record on this. Never separate the two. And you can take the verses Jesus said. It's not what goes out of a man that defiles him. I mean, kind of goes into his mouth that defiles him. Now you look at that and you can see the health message. You can see the health message. Can you see it in John 1? Yes. Come on, John 1. John 1. It's the Creator. John 2. You talked about it the other day. John 3. It's Nicodemus. What did he need? A better diet. Is Jesus going to give it to him? Yes. Unless you eat the flesh. John chapter 6. Back to John 5. Pull of Bethesda. John chapter 4. She needed some kind of water better than what she had. It's the health message in every chapter of every book in the whole Bible. In one form or another. It permeates the Bible. One size does not fit all. Dear friends, if one gospel doesn't fit all, we need two gospels. One health message is two. The gospel is a mirror of the health message. Now, I've got to start going fast because I want to finish today because there's so much and we've got so few hours left. This is your lifestyle diseases. See, osteoporosis, arthritis, heart disease, right on down the list, right? No matter what you look at, no matter what you flip up there, it all has the same risk factors, just about more or less. You want to increase your risk for pancreatic cancer, have a hypertension. You want to increase your risk for pancreatic cancer, be diabetic. You want to increase your risk for pancreatic cancer, be obese. You want to increase, yeah, it's just, they're all the same, right? It, all, it doesn't change. When you have lifestyle issues, your risk factors go up. Now, I'm an evangelist for God. I'm going out and preach to go, <laughs> heart attack, died, drop dead at 45. And God said, you robbed me. You robbed me. If you're going to work for God, He wants you in top-notch, lean, mean, walking, working machine. Doesn't he? Well, i got to give some Hershey Kisses and some jelly beans, just some fuel for the day. No, no, no. God said, come ye... Well, never mind. You don't look in there. Statement of objectives. And by the way, our message is inspired. Came out of 17104. This is the plan. People come here, they get well. Number two, they ask questions. Number three, they get answers. Number four, they share it with others. Disseminate and advance the reform. That's it. Last but not least, Saturday Evening Post, which is a secular journal written by a man, Patrick Perry, who is a secular man. A secular man writing in a secular paper about sacred topics. And this is what he had to say. Members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, he said a couple things that were wrong here. I'm going to correct his mistakes. Members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church are often acknowledged as the healthiest people in America. And a nation with increasing cases of heart disease, obesity, osteoporosis, cancer, and other diet-related maladies, this denomination's adherents have managed to beat the odds. Study after study has found that church members not only live longer, but experience few of the debilitating diseases that affect most Americans. Consider the following statistics. Male Seventh-day Adventists have a life expectancy about nine years longer than the average, while females have one that is seven and a half years longer. Some of these studies say almost 10 years longer. Even though vegetarians, wrong. The great majority are not. They're not. He's wrong. Even though vegetarians, not for it, not against it, it's legal to eat clean meat. You can go to heaven eating it, but he's wrong. Seventh-day Adventists have reduced risk of osteoporosis compared to meat eaters in the general population. Members experience a lower incidence of breast, prostate, pancreatic, bladder. God sits back there and says, say thank you. Come on, say thank you. All right. I was laying in the VA hospital. The guy next to me was about to have a tumor taken off his bladder. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Another guy came out of the surgery, and I won't tell you what was wrong with him. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
even though vegetarians, Seventh-day Adventists, have a reduced risk of osteoporosis compared to meat eaters in the general population. Members experience a lower incidence of breast, prostate, pancreatic, bladder, here it comes, and ovarian cancer than the general population. I put this article in here to read this. Adventists who use no meat, milk, or eggs, what do you call that? Vegan. Like a vegan, right? A vegan. Total vegans have an expected coronary heart disease mortality rate. I'm going to have to round this to 10 so I can make simple math. 10%. In other words, you take 10 guys, I'm one of them. You get down to Florence, you gather up 10 guys, and they grab me. They throw me in a room. Who'll be the last one to get heart disease? Me. And by the way, friends, God save anybody from heart disease, right? And I don't want anybody to get heart disease. But we'd be the last ones to get it. So as uh, the battle, wa the wax is hot, and we're given the message, we'll be the last to fall by disease. Mm -hmm. By disease. Taken out by disease. Ken Wa Kim Williams, Dr. Kim Williams, past president of the American Cardiology College of Cardiology, said, I don't mind dying but I don't want it to be the result of my own decisions. Boy, you want to watch something good sometime? K-I-M, Kim Williams, Dr. Kim Williams, American College, College of Cardiology. Not, not a, not a Seventh-day Adventist, but what he, when he talks about heart disease, 12% uh, of the general population, non-vegetarian male Adventists have 56% 50%, of the expected coronary heart disease mortality rate. The closer you come to God's plan, the more the result you get. Fully engaging God's plan, I wonder what our lifespan would be. I'm not trying to boast. I have the worst lifestyle on planet Earth for many, many years, and I should do better than I'm doing now. Seventh-day Adventists teach prevention of disease by lifestyle management. The secret to healthy living, they believe, is not how much you eat, but what you eat and when. Well, how much too, right? Well, you know, it's, it's uh, whole grains. Well, now here, here, here he is, Patrick Perry. Come on, Pat. Give us the menu. Whole grains. Is he right so far? Okay. Water. Okay. Fresh fruits. Is he okay? Vegetables. Boom. That's it. Key role in the church's diet. Brisk walks. Now, if he came in to our little party and he saw us eating a whole bunch of Doritos, nobody can eat just one, and we're piling on this, uh, <laughs> you know, Patrick Perry would walk out disillusioned. I'm saying this to myself, not to you. What does this mean? Now, why I'm reading this, remember the steps. You got to get better. Then they ask questions. You give answers. Disseminate light. Remember that, the plan. Uh, let me finish that first. Whole grains, water, fresh fruits, and vegetables play a key role in the church's diet. But brisk walks, a hearty main meal breakfast, and avoidance of smoking, alcohol, sugar, and fat are also important. What does this mean for those of us who are not Seventh-day Adventists? Ask authors Chris Rucker and Jan, ha Jan Hoffman in the Seventh-day Adventist Diet. It means that instead of waiting for science to give us a magic pill for cancer, instead of waiting for more expensive, sophisticated types of surgery to control heart disease, instead of cringing at the thought of another painful, self-depriving weight loss program, what does he say? Go to the Seventh-day Adventist, look what they're doing, and then do it. That's what the Saturday Evening Post said. Yeah. Go to the Seventh-day Adventists. Do what they do. Do what they do. We encourage you to investigate further practice and practice the principles of the Seventh-day Adventist diet. <laughs> Who's that in the middle? Front row center. And there it is. Loma Linda, the first graduating class. That's a picture of Dee Robinson beside the cover of the Storber Health Message. And I'll tell you what, it is a tremendous advantage to be in that movement. A tremendous advantage, isn't it? Because all the confusion today, I mean, it's a tremendous advantage. So let me just, I'll use myself, but that's okay, I'll use myself. I'll take two or three verses, uh, John 18, 36. My kingdom is not of this 
There's a night and day difference between God's kingdom. Now, the Holy Ghost applying scriptures, remember that Holy Ghost can change. If he wants to take something and apply it differently, let him apply it. My kingdom is not of this world, okay? We're going to do what Jesus did in his kingdom. And in and, and Joshua 5, 13, 14, he came as a warrior, right? He's a man of war in Exodus 15, verse 3. Jesus knows how to fight, Revelation 12, verse 7. He made war. He knows how to fight. But now he says, no more war. Conscientious objectors. You are. Consci 18, 11, uh, 18, 11 of John, Peter put up the sword. Because 26, 50, 52 of Matthew, you live by the sword. You Actually, it says perish by the sword, die by the sword. We're not doing that anymore. But wait a minute. David fought. Come on. Joshua fought. Jesus fought. And now you say we're not fighting anymore? That's just what the Holy Ghost says. Things are changing. Conscientious objectors. Why? Take care of the body. <laughs> Don't break other bodies. Don't have yours broken. Is that a, is that a better kingdom? Mm -hmm. Come on, Rick. Let's go out and uh, get some guns and go out like, you know, like Joshua did. <laughs> Aren't you glad? Where's the, get the sword. <laughs> we got a different sword today. Now, James 4.4. 4. A friend of the world is an enemy with God. It never said God is an enemy to you. You become His enemy. When you love the world, you become an enemy of God. Now, Rick was sharing something the other day, talking about Christ and quoting some verses, the wife, and I said, Ephesians 5.25, Christ is the husband, and the wife is, I'm sorry, well, Christ, in a sense, is the husband, and I'm His, I'm his bride, I'm His wife, okay, in that sense. Is that okay to say that? If today, today, be honest, because this is Revelation 17, uh, uh, spiritual adultery, it's, this is biblical. If I am murdered today, a violent murder, a violent murder, and I see the guy that's murdering me just before he murders me, it's me, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, he murders me, and then God resurrects me like he did Moses, and I go back home, and Darlene's in bed with the guy that murdered me. Tell me how that makes me feel. The same way God feels if you go back to the world and you're in bed with the men that killed Christ. Because the world killed Christ before and they would what? Kill him again. You go back to the world, you are in bed with the men that killed your Lord. Lord have mercy. Now, you say, well, I love both. Can a man serve? If you love the one, what? You can't. You, can. you got to choose ye this day, and the health message is part of the choice. And I tell you what, it's coming in the future, right? The test comes in connection with genuine, remember that quote, genuine medical mission. I, I hate to quote something without showing it. It's coming. Now, I don't want to sound like a, a, like a rebel this morning or anything, but health ministry, this is health evangelism. This is where it's at. Yeah, because a lot of people won't listen to Daniel. But they'll listen to osteoporosis prevention. Mm. I'll pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for a nice message, the three angels' message, the health message. The, 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 they're, they're good. And I'm not. I'm a mess. I falter. I fail. But the message is perfect. It never does. Because it came from a God who can't fail or falter. So bless us as we try to uh, eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of God today. That we might enjoy health and health more abundantly for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.